Okay, so good evening, bonsoir, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight uh, for the event, Reconnect, Create, uh, Celebrate, presented by the Embassy of Japan and Ikebana Ohara School Ota Chapter. My name is Murata Atsushi, Director of Information and Culture Center of the Embassy of Japan in Canada. I'm very honored to do MC for this event today. It's a special, more, special occasion for me this time. As I'm completing my mission and leaving Canada next week, and my time in Ottawa was very great and wonderful thanks to all of you who cooperated with the embassy and support us. With Ohara School, I have collaborated a lot, of, uh, a lot with them to create many events. I hope uh, I can have performed well during my mission here, like an uh, Ikebana flower shows its best figure during the limited moment. I would like to express a million of thanks to all of you. Um, so, excuse me for talking about myself. So now uh, to begin the event, I would like to invite His Excellency Kamura Yasuhisa, Ambassador of Japan to Canada to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Murata-san. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, let me start. Well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this guided uh, virtual tour of the uh, Ohara School of Ikebana Orawa chapter, Reconnect, Create, Celebrate. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette visite uh, guidée virtuelle. I would like to thank Ms. Uh, Michelle Baron uh, for conducting the virtual tour of the exhibition today. I hope this tour will make you feel connected to Japan and will inspire you to celebrate the relationship between the uh, uh, two countries. I also hope that the exhibit and tour will make you interested in learning more about the wonderful art of Ikebana and perhaps try it for yourself. Merci de participer à cette visite. N'hésitez pas à poser des questions. <clears throat> Thank you for being with us today. Please enjoy the tour. Uh, thank you uh, very much, His Excellency Ambassador Kamula. So now I would like to invite today's virtual tour presenter, Ms. Michelle Baron from Ikebana Opera School, Ottawa Chapter. Um, if you have any question during the tour, please use Q&A function that is uh, shown on the screen. So, okay, so please, uh, Michelle, I invite you us to the beautiful world of Wikibana. Wonderful, thank you so much. Hopefully everyone will be able to hear me. Please let me know if that's not the case. Um, but on behalf of the Ohara School of Wikibana, President Wendy Batson and Exhibition Chair Elizabeth Armstrong Crow. I would like to first thank the Embassy of Japan for hosting and for the extensive preparation of the Ohara School's virtual exhibition, Recreate, sorry, Reconnect, Create and Celebrate. In the past, the Embassy has generously hosted an annual in-person exhibition, which has not been possible since 2019. Their guidance and hard work in preparing the materials for last year and this year's exhibition is greatly appreciated and important to the school. Specifically, thank you to Mr. Barada, Ms. Satiko Trivers, and Brandon Wallace for your assistance and ensuring this virtual tour would be possible. And a special thank you to Ambassador Kawamura for your ongoing support of the Ikebana School and its exhibitions. I also want to again thank Wendy Batson, president of the O'Hara School of Ikebana, Ottawa's chapter, the chapter's board members who have been supportive and have offered their knowledge, insight, and expertise throughout this process. And finally, thank you to all of the exhibition contributors. Without your creative work, the exhibition would not have been possible. These past two years have been unusual and challenging for everyone, including the O'Hara School. Teachers have been unable to offer and attend regular workshops and classes, 
and events and exhibitions have had to look very different. So the theme of this year's exhibition is one of reimagining. The title is Reconnect, Create, Celebrate. The process of connecting with community, creating and making art, and celebrating with friends and family has been in a liminal space since 2020. This past year has allowed us to stretch our legs a little bit and create pockets of a new normal. This has created opportunities to connect with the Ikebana community online through events such as this. So that's all to say that the theme this year re reflects the new hope for new connections, creations, celebrations as we approach 2022. So this presentation will begin with an exciting video demonstration of Wendy Batson making an arrangement. Please note that there were some minor audio issues during the shooting of this video, and I did try my best to adjust accordingly. Uh, from there, I will guide everyone through the online exhibition on the Embassy's website. You're welcome to ask questions in the question and answers feature of the Zoom call throughout the presentation. There will be some time at the end of the presentation for me to answer, for me to answer or address those questions. It should be noted that I'm a beginner of the Ikebana practice, a non-Japanese member of the school, and very early on in my understanding of the art, and will subsequently look to my knowledgeable cohort teachers and Ikebana experts at the O'Hara School to answer any questions that I may not have an immediate answer to. If you're interested in future classes, events, exhibitions, you're more than welcome to visit the O'Hara website, Facebook, and Instagram pages. I know my head is covering the, inst the uh, Facebook full name, but they are up there. <laughs> uh, you can also visit the Embassy's website for information. So at this point, I'm going to hopefully share my screen uh, and we'll hopefully have no technical issues as I share the demonstration video. So be patient with me for just a moment. Um, please let me know right off the bat if you're unable to hear the sound. In this video, Wendy Batson will be demonstrating an Ikebana arrangement called Heika or Tall Vase in slanting style. This arrangement utilizes three plant materials, rhododendron, bittersweet, and hydrangea reflecting Ottawa's peak autumn season. Wendy begins by choosing a sturdy branch to cut into two small pieces, roughly the diameter of the container. These will be crossed to create a stay or a means to support the plants rather than a kenzan. And this keeps our branches and materials in place. We don't use kenzans in tall vase or heka, we use these stays. You just put it in and you pull it right up and it stays in place. As Wendy mentioned, these stays will support the materials placed in the vase throughout the arrangement. Rhododendron is chosen for the subject and secondary branches. Carefully placing the main subject of the arrangement in the vase on a slant, Wendy positions the branch to reach left. The branch is secured with wire to the stay to prevent tilting or rotating. The secondary branch is always the same material as the subject branch, but shorter. I'm using a different material. This is bittersweet. It, it, this is, of course, the very, um, it, we usually get it around in the fall. And I'm putting it in with my tall filler branch. I'm 
I'm actually working from behind, so as I do the arrangement, you can see it from the front. Bittersweet branches create both the tall and short filler materials for the arrangement. The hydrangea will be the object of the arrangement. The stem is cut underwater to ensure that it remains hydrated. Small rhododendron branch is used as a cascade piece near the front. The remaining filler branches are added. Perfect. So again, hopefully everyone was able to hear that okay. Um, again, big thanks to Wendy for all of her support in preparing, uh, in preparing that creation for us. Um, but before we jump into the online or the tour of the online exhibition, I wanted to give you a brief overview of Ikebana itself as an art, a practice, and a reflection of spirituality, history, and culture. Ikebana is the art of flower arranging. Ikebana, or Kado, means living flowers or way of flowers, and its origins trace back hundreds of years with his, its historical roots embedded in the Heian period in Japan, when floral offerings were made at altars. But the history continued as Ikebana was used in the alcoves of Japanese homes, through histories of Buddhist tea masters, and evolving through numerous distinct schools of thought and teaching. Ikebana exists as a contemporary art, combining theory, careful practice, and perhaps a bit of patience. In contrast to Western approaches to floral arrangements in vases which prioritize large, fully blooming flowers with complementing colors, Ikebana is a discipline that aims to bring out the inner qualities of nature, using plant and flower material throughout their life stages, and playing with elements of space, lines, form, imperfection, and harmony. For example, one flower may be blooming while another flower may be in its initial budding stages. Through design tension, emphasis, and under certain rules of construction, Ikebana arrangements aim to express emotion without words and convey meaning just as paintings, sculptures, and other forms of art. Although there are several schools of Ikebana teaching and approaches to the art, one particular uniting idea of the practice is the beauty in asymmetry and the exploration of opposites. Many arrangements and arrangement styles highlight a play between visible, invisible, presence, absence, life, death, and nature and curation. As I mentioned, there are several schools of Ikebana, each following a particular set of rules and arrangement techniques. Ikenobo was the first Iken Iken Ikebana school established in Kyoto and is still in operation today. The Ohara school of Ikebana was founded by Unshin Ohara in the 1800s, who was born in Matsui City, Japan. Through his exploration of regional mountains and fields, he developed the Moribana style of Ikebana that uses shallow circular ceramic containers and kenzans. Five headmasters has, have succeeded Unshin Ohara to date. Under the leadership of Ohara's son, an innovative teaching method and group lessons took shape for the first time. And for, again, for the first time in history, teaching certificates were awarded to women. Overall, the Ohara School developed four approaches to arrangements, Hana Isho, Moribana, Heika, and Hanamai. 
These range from basic to advanced in their construction rules and study, but the quintessential O'Hara arrangements utilize their, their landscapes and surroundings for inspiration. Currently, the school is under the leadership of the young fifth headmaster, the great, great grandson of the founder. The, the O'Hara School has over a million students throughout the world with main offices in Tokyo, Osaka, and Kobe. There are 158 chapters in Japan, as well as 56 chapters and 34 study groups outside of Japan. The Ottawa chapter of the O'Hara School was established in 1989 by a founding group of six members. The chapter currently has over 60 members each year and offer an array of Ikebana classes, events, and lessons. Members participate in the annual, annual O'Hara School Public Exhibition, which has been kindly hosted by the Ottawa Embassy of Japan for a number of years. At this point, uh, I'm going to share my screen um, and give, us a, give everyone a tour of the exhibition. Please be patient with my pronunciation of plant names. If anyone attended last year's exhibition, I'm sure you remember my stumbling through Fugia, um, and whatever the official name for burning bush is. I'm not going to try that one, but give me one moment. I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully. that took more cl clicks than I expected. Um, are you, can someone confirm that you're able to see the Embassy of Japan website page? Looks like my share screen is paused. One moment, let me try it one more time. Okay. I think everyone's able to see it. I'm just going to maximize it. Again, my apologies for the little bit of a slow start there. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to jump right into this first one. Okay. Perfect. So this is the first photo of the set. The first arrangement in this series is by Wendy Batson, a second term master of Ikebana. This arrangement is a rising Hannah Isho style, utilizing driftwood rather than a typical vase. But hidden amongst the driftwood is likely a small vessel of water to keep the plant materials hydrated. The relationship in this particular piece between the subject and the secondary material is particularly important to Hannah Isho, both the subject and secondary being the pine branches reaching up and the shorter branch reaching right. The degree and angle of these branches is the same in all Hannah Isho iterations. So Helen Westington created a morimono style arrangement. What's most striking about this arrangement, in my opinion, is the use of fungi at the base. Polypore, shelf, or bracket fungi commonly grow on the trunks of trees. In this arrangement, the smallest rings on the bracket fungi, where it would typically be attached to bark, is where the bittersweet aster and Japanese quince branches sprout from, giving the appearance of one point of growth for all of the plant material. As you look at that initial point and your eyes make your way to the very left where the aster branch reaches, we see the largest rings of the fungi. Irma Van Ruten created a landscape style arrangement, which is a Moribana style that emphasizes the appearance of landscapes in a low vase. One key element of this style is that the arrangement typically represents a particular season and region. The chrysanthemums and parsley seem to reflect a late summer, early autumn harvest. These next three photos are arrangements by Iris Wong, 
a third term master. All three photos expertly integrate pieces of driftwood into the design, creating the appearance of flowers sprouting from the driftwood itself. This first arrangement by Iris is a Bunjin style. Bunjin Ikebana arrangements feature plant material that may have a symbolic meaning, or so be it their type or be it their color. Typically, larger flowers are used for Bunjin arrangements, and the piece, this piece, uh, and sorry, and Bunjin pieces are typically inspired by Chinese and Japanese paintings. Similarly, this next photo includes prominent flowers and a piece of driftwood that cascades in the front. The third arrangement by Iris is in landscape style, utilizing a tall piece of driftwood to draw our attention upwards to the height of the piece. The length of the tall subject branch is carefully balanced by the large hosta leaves near the base of the arrangement. Lynn White prepared three arrangements for this exhibition, utilizing tall containers and driftwood. This is the first arrangement, the large caster bean leaves jetting out to the side are, co are contradicted by the twisting driftwood reaching upwards. Notice the interesting placement of the vase on the wooden base. Rather than placing the vase in the center of the wood slab, Lim intentionally placed it to the right, further ensuring that the arrangement, although asymmetric, feels balanced. The next arrangement is Hannah Isho style. The yellow flower pops against the brown and greens of the other plant material. Lynn carefully placed the flower along the same line as the subject branch, emphasizing the flow of this particular piece. The sharp, angles of the driftwood and the container in Lin's final arrangement is juxtaposed with the delicate Japanese, wait, uh, anemone, an an anemone, Japanese anemone. Um, these flowers here, if you're able to see my mouse, uh, they're known for their late autumn blooms that op actually open up in the wind. This next arrangement by Lorraine Paradis includes warm hues and features seasonal autumn grasses, leaves, and flowers. The twisting corkscrew hazel and sweeping grasses contrast one another in this particular piece. You can see here you have this beautiful, interesting twisting of the branch. And again, you have the grasses that are very smooth in comparison. So these next two arrangements are by Mitsuko Kawasaki, who is a second term master. One of the materials used in this arrangement is fasciated willow. Fasciated willow is a flexible branch that can be carefully bent and manipulated to suit many styles. For this particular piece, the curve of the vertical subject branch seems to flow into the white flowers. As we saw with Wendy's demonstration, we have the subject branch that goes up here, as you can hopefully see by my mouse. Mitsuko's second arrangement is a one row style. Unlike the previous arrangements, curves and flow, this piece features a very different sense of movement. The three main bundles are carefully placed in one horizontal line. The stems of all of the plant material line up in the kenzan, and then the leaves, stalk, and flowers are carefully pulled forward or backward to bring some sort of depth into the row. 
So although you can't completely tell in the to see the Kenzans or the bottom of those stalks of flowers, um, they all have to line up in this particular type of or style of arrangement. Allison Cumming, Cumminer's uh, Rimpa style arrangement includes two pink varieties of flowers, as well as beautiful variegated pink coleus. One particular element of this arrangement to observe is that the flowers don't sit at the same height or angle as one another. In Rimpa arrangements, the decorative aesthetic of the plant material is the focus, emulating the Rimpa paintings of the Edo period. But again, I want everyone to pay particular attention to how carefully uh, the flowers were put in to make sure that you know, they're not all at the same height or level. It adds some variety and some depth to the arrangement. The next two arrangements are made by Karen McClure and include bright autumn colors. An important part of Ikebana is that the plant stems must be in water to ensure the longevity of the arrangement. You can see in this picture, for example, the water level in this vase covers the Kenzan and the water will be topped up throughout the life of this arrangement. So if all of the stems are placed in the Kenzan and they are, they're well hydrated, it should last a while. Karen's second arrangement also includes a blue container, but this one is a very different shape. Rather than round, this elongated vase is used for one row style. Although the different angles of flowers and leaves create a lot of dimension, as we talked about in the other one row um, arrangement, this one row arrangement requires again that all of the bases of the stems line up in one row. Kyoko Kosaki, a third term master, created a Bunshin style arrangement featuring orchids, driftwood, and a large monstera leaf. Although only three materials were used for this particular arrangement, the size and height create impressive shapes. Picture this arrangement with small daisies. They would become very lost besides the large single leaf and twisting wood. It's the scale of the orchid flowers that really brings a sense of cohesion to this piece, in my opinion. Patty McLaughlin created a type of Hannah Isho style arrangement. Similar to the other Hannah Isho styles, the branch extending upwards and the branch extending to the right, so that's the subject and the secondary branches of this of the arrangement, are the key focal points. This particular arrangement includes a combination of Hannah Isho styles. So Patty chose to include a secondary ring of flowers near the base or the bottom there. The oranges and yellows of the smaller flowers work well with the orange flowers and the taller portion of the arrangement to create again some sort of cohesive larger image. If the smaller flowers at the bottom were all blue or purple, um, you wouldn't see that type of cohesion that makes this piece look like it's, it's one single piece and not two separate arrangements put together. So the next two arrangements are made by Margaret Wright. This first arrangement is beautiful in its simplicity. The Hannah Mai style is known for its appreciation of the structural elements of materials. The style of arrangement has typically less rules than other styles. Um, and as you can see in this arrangement, the monster leaf and the yellow flowers appear to be dancing and interacting. The second arrangement by Margaret uses sunflowers in several stages of their life. As many of you know, the sunflower blooms late summer and is really only around for a short amount of time before autumn strips away its petals and the seeds and inner portion remain. This arrangement highlights the short but diverse autumn season that we see in Ottawa. We don't always get to see um, that kind of late stage floral in some of these arrangements, but the autumn season is really good for that.
Samantha Hoag created a radial style arrangement with long bittersweet branches and small orchid flowers amongst grasses and leaves. This particular arrangement utilizes tall vase, which as we saw from the demonstration video, takes a lot of practice to be able to place the stays in just right. Without wooden stays, it would be nearly impossible to place the branches at a correct angle. Um, again, as we, as Wendy demonstrated, typically um, some of the larger, heavier branches need to be wired on so that they don't tilt and flop over. Once the main pieces are are placed and wired in, um, some of the other branches are able to, to rest on them a little more securely. And this is uh, my arrangement. I created this arrangement in a realistic landscape style. I chose material that looked as though it could be found at the edge of a pond sprouting near the water. I wanted the short yellow flowers to pop against the darker autumn leaves. And to ensure the arrangement didn't look too heavy or short, I included tall, wispy grasses. Mary Eve Kopal created an impressively tall arrangement using several pieces of driftwood, large castor bean leaves, and red and white, white roses. Although it's hard to tell from this photo, this arrangement is too big to carry or transport. So I'm assuming it's still in fact sitting in Mary Ev's backyard. The driftwood uh, was collected on a riverbank near Mary Ev's house and allows her to create some interesting angles and movement through the piece. You can see here, there's some cute little red flowers that are popping out on the bottom left of the, um, of the arrangement. So in contrast to the size of Mary Eve's arrangement, Patricia Holland's arrangement emphasizes the beauty of smaller understated materials. Patricia is a fourth term master and chose Morimono style to display festive gourds. One of my favorite aspects of this arrangement is that you can see the reflection of the materials on the slick base. I think that adds a really interesting element. It would also be really interesting, I think, to have some of these arrangements uh, displayed on mirrors. I think that would, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that would add to it or not, but I think that would be a fun practice. So Lindsay uh, uh, McCretcher uh, created a realistic landscape using a wonderfully quirky branch on the right. The sharp edges of the branch, I think, is balanced really nicely with, again, the softer curves of the grasses that are on the left. I'm not sure if I got those directions mixed up, but I, I like the, the balance in this one. So this arrangement was made by uh, Mai Nguyen, who chose a tall vase style. Stunning purple orchids protrude from the top of the driftwood. And if you look closely under the orchid leaves, you can see a small bracket or shelf fungi. This mushroom carefully ties together all of the plant materials into what looks like one growth point. Which of course was intentional. So Donna Cowell, a second term master, used pink hydrangea as the object of her radial style arrangement. Donna has an eye for design and when and the way she's able to assemble materials in record-breaking time is always impressive. My favorite part of this arrangement is the little cascading driftwood right near the front of the vase that you only really notice in your second time viewing this piece. I, again, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but it's right at the front right there. So Adrienne uh, Dodell and Lynn Williams created a wonderful double realistic landscape arrangement set. Uh, the beautiful blue bottom of the sweet bands or large containers make it appear as though the tufts of plants are sprouting on a riverbank. The two containers work well together to create one exhibit um, as opposed to kind of two separate ones. I think the use of the same materials um, harmonize the two really nicely. And you can see that the Kenzans are 
expertly hidden in these pieces. We don't see any of the Ken Vans in these ones. So the next three arrangements are made by Cliff Burns, a second term master. Cliff is drawn to bold and contrasting colors and any drooping, dead or wilting leaf has clearly promptly been removed. These arrangements feel fresh and lively. Note the brightly orange dahlia peeking through the left side of this arrangement. This next arrangement is in climbing form style and uses Canadian holly as the subject branch. Note that the length of the subject branch is always less than twice the length of the container to ensure that the piece doesn't look unbalanced. So the size and length of the container will dictate um, the size and length that you can use for the, um, for the material you find. Or depending on the material that you find, sometimes that dictates the container you're able to use. So Cliff's third arrangement includes plants that look as though they're climbing up the vase towards the hydrangea petals. In this Bujan style arrangement, Cliff included several air plants and pitcher plants. You can see an air plant that's hiding just up top on the driftwood, as well as climbing down the driftwood and one that's hoping, I think, to climb the driftwood. The next three arrangements are created by Anne Levison. For this first piece, she used free expression style. The stark lines of the plant material contrast the burst of understated pink in the Dusty Miller leaves. It's a fun piece of driftwood. Anne's second arrangement features sea holly reaching upwards. Sea holly is a versatile plant that can be used in medicine or through the autumn season as a dried arrangement. You can see it right at the top there. Anna's, or sorry, Anne's final exhibit uses three vases to create what appears to be an interactive Hanami style arrangement. The grasses, Japanese barberry, and driftwood seem to be in conversation with, the, with one another, stretching to overlap. The next two arrangements were created by Penny Stewart. The first arrangement is a one row style featuring three pink varieties of flowers. Pay special attention to the height of these materials. In one row, you don't want it to look like a staircase or a ladder where the heights move from ascending to descending or vice versa. So we can see in this arrangement that the heights are varied to include the shortest one in the center. Penny's second exhibit includes sunflowers and grasses in a radial style. So this arrangement, being radial, uh, can be viewed from any angle. And the different positions of the grasses around the arrangement give movement and what appears to be wind flow. So Sandra Olney is a third term master and created the next two arrangements. Sandra's first exhibit here is a landscape arrangement that looks like a wintry scene from afar. The Canadian holly and red leaves create a lovely contrast with the cedar and the pine. I was going to say we also have juniper, but it turns out I don't know my plant material that well. I don't see juniper in that material list. Okay, so this Bunjin arrangement uses a stunning open dahlia as the main object or focal point. All of the materials you can see in this create one long curved line of sight, which I think is a particular strength of this arrangement. The next three arrangements were created by Elaine Collin. Elaine's first arrangement is rising form style in a tall vase. 
The large fanning leaves at the top of the vase create a base for the other materials to sprout from. This next arrangement by Elaine is landscape style. This piece looks like a miniature landscape with all the small parsley leaves and, seed, and sedum flowers. And snake plants are wonderful because they're very low maintenance. So if you're looking for a long lasting arrangement that doesn't necessarily need a lot of light, always include snake plants. Just a tip. So Elaine's final arrangement is Hanamai. This style features materials typically that cross and reach towards each other. These arrangements are typically minimalist, as we can see here, but they're always a little playful in their appearance. Okay, so let me just stop sharing my screen. Um, so that marks the end of our exhibition walkthrough, um, but I want to end by saying that Ikebana is a practice in careful placement, in aesthetics, in mirroring nature, in simplicity, and in imperfection. The designs created become more than just a combination of materials, but designs that evoke something larger, be it changing of seasons, the availability of materials due to climate change, the size and placement of the arrangement, maybe because of COVID, um, and the emotions and creativity that the artist ultimately brings to their arrangement that will shape the viewer's experience. I want to again thank the embassy and everyone involved in this virtual tour. I appreciate all of your time um, and all of you who came to view the tour. So I will now open it up for questions before I, I pass the presentation to Mr. Murata for closing. Um, so let me just see, it doesn't appear as though we have any questions. So I will give um, attendees a minute or so if they want, if you want to quickly type in any questions about the arrangements or the different styles, or um, if you have a particular question about the O'Hara School, then I'll, I'll do my best to answer. No pressure. Oh, we have, sorry, I didn't check the chat. Um, so where do Ikebana practitioners get their materials? That's a great question. Um, so it, it definitely depends on, um, on the practitioner. It depends on the teacher. Um, it depends on their relationship with um, local flower growers, gardeners, and farmers. Um, my teacher, who I'm, I'm going to throw under the bus for this, um, she will pull over on the side of the road and find some beautiful things in the ditch that are just growing and that she loves. Uh, her garden is also a great resource. As I mentioned earlier, Maryev um, finds beautiful driftwood that washes up on the riverbank near her house. Um, it, it depends on uh, the season. So February, for example, uh, maybe the local independent will have more flowers than the rest of Ottawa, unfortunately. Um, but typically, um, if you're if you're looking at doing an arrangement at home, um, I would look to my garden or the park, and then maybe supplement it with with a pretty chrysanthemum or something that that I buy. Um, but uh, I know that um, practitioners will also go to their neighbors, or um, again, if there's lots of local flower farmers that um, are more than happy to to support with that. Um, so the next question, how long does it take to produce and to produce an arrangement? So um, that's also a great question. Um, so an arrangement um, that I make might take between an hour or two hours, depending on how difficult it is or how finicky the materials are. If it's tall vase, it might take me um, the rest of my life. Tall vase days are very difficult, um, but then you have someone, like I mentioned, Donna, who seems to be able to take four and a half minutes to come up with the most beautiful arrangement. She just has an eye for what the style needs to look like when she sees the materials. Um, so that's impressive. The demonstration that Wendy did, it took her maybe um, 10 to 15 minutes um, to, you know, get all the different materials that she that she wanted to use and place it in the vase. So that was also impressive. So um, practice makes perfect. I think with the more practice, the, 
the maybe shorter the time it takes to be able to visualize what the material should look like in the vase based on the material type and the angles of the material. I know that, you know, if you're looking at um, the subject branch, you know, you want something with some interesting curves, you need it to be of a certain height. So, you know, it depends on what materials you are able to gather or you are able to buy that might dictate, you know, how quick you're able to put it together because ultimately, um, the material has to work well in the in the whole arrangement as a whole. So it can take a little bit of, um, you know, curving the branch or playing with the branch to really get that um, to in, in a way that you want it to look like. Um, so another question is, has Ikebana changed or affected your life outlook? And if so, how? Um, I think um, for lots of people, um, the the practice of of you know carefully um, cutting flowers and of placing flowers and you know and plant material very carefully I think the whole process can be relatively meditative um, it can be very focused and so that can be a, an important element to take to remove yourself from all of the work and all of the other things that you've been doing that week and really um, you know push your focus into something so I think that's always important. Um, but I also think it's given me um, a, a different appreciation for different types of aesthetics and different um, color combinations and even photography and the way that, you know, something is looking. I think I'm much more drawn now to kind of looking at, at or appreciating asymmetry and not having, you know, both sides be the same, which I think, you know, typically... Western floral arrangements are, are looking, they want that symmetry, they want all the flowers to be blooming at the same time. Um, they want, you know, all of the different materials to be really complementing each other and Ikebana really pulls um, out of that into kind of a more tense zone where, um, you know, the materials are actually supposed to be kind of speaking to each other. And so I have much more appreciation for, um, uh, for, for different styles that, that might emulate that. And what made you start practicing Ikebana? So um, my, my friend, uh, Samantha Hogue, we got to see her tall vase arrangement. She started practicing Ikebana in Toronto. When she came back to Ottawa, um, she took me to one of the classes. Uh, this was pre-pandemic, so this was in person. Uh, feels like a blur now, but um, that was fun. And I kept up with it. And... I have been very thankful to have Wendy as my teacher, who has been very accommodating to um, our schedules and very flexible. And so I've got to learn a lot of different types of styles. It's definitely an ongoing practice. Um, and sometimes, you know, even if you think that, you know, you're staring at the instructions and one of the angles is supposed to be 45 degrees, one of the angles is supposed to be 90 degrees and you have all the measurements and you put it in and it doesn't look good. And then Wendy comes and helps me replace it all. Um, so sometimes there's a, you know, an element of play and ele an element of creativity in the construction that also, you know, takes some practice and uh, a careful eye that I think I'm still um, trying to develop. Yeah. Uh, so another question, can you explain more about the different schools of Ikebana? Um, also, we got a lovely greeting from the O'Hara chapter in um, Buenos, Ari, Bre Buenos Aires. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us. That's very exciting. We're happy to have you here. Um, can I, but so can I explain a little bit more about the different schools of Ikebana? Um, so I don't have a ton of information, unfortunately, to give you uh, on the different schools of, of teaching. Um, there are um, different approaches to um, to the different kind of branch styles. You'll note that when it comes to the O'Hara school, I'm saying the subject, I'm saying the object, and I'm saying the secondary. These are all um, labels that we give the different elements of the arrangement. And by we, I mean the chapter. I don't mean that I am. I'm respecting the rules of, of the O'Hara Ikebana school. Um, but those labels actually differ from school to school. Um, so in some schools, they're considered um, uh, man, god, and um, 
environment or I'm not 100% sure, but I know that they there is slight difference in the meaning, um, the inspiration that they're drawing from is slightly different. The um, the way or the angles are slightly different um, depending on the school of thought, um, but it's similar to schools of thought of, of painting where, I mean, ultimately, you know, they might use slightly different or have a preference for slightly different materials or slightly different brush strokes, but um, there's definitely um, kind of an exciting appreciation for, for each approach, I think. Um, so if you arrange a cabana now, what kinds of flowers do I use and why? So now that we're in the late autumn season, um, we do have a lot of bittersweet, which we saw in several arrangements, which is exciting because they're beautiful with the little red berries. And fun fact, you can also um, dry bittersweet and they dry very, very well. You just be very careful because the berries are delicate and will drop off and then you'll end up with just a branch. Um, which is less aesthetically pleasing, but um, bittersweet are great. Um, any kind of um, anything, any greens that you're pulling out of your garden in preparation for winter um, is also a great approach. So I have some remaining kale. Um, I've seen some really wonderful um, modern Ikebana um, approaches. So I have this fun book. I don't know if you can see it because of my background. Um, it's called Ikebana Unbound. Um, and they also feature some edible ikebana arrangements, uh, which is a lot of fun. So the idea that you could eat all of the different plant materials, you know, slowly picking apart the arrangement, um, which is a whole nother um, potential level to this type of art. Um, but again, kind of plant material that you might have. Um, you can make um, beautiful arrangements using like cabbage heads, for example, in, in place of flowers. Um, or we have kind of some of the, again, flowers that are slowly drying out and are in that last phase of life. Those are still always fun to try and make an arrangement around. And so another question um, is how long does an arrangement typically last? So it depends on the material. Um, if, uh, if it's like a tulip, for example, it might last significantly less time than um, than a fasciated willow or, you know, it, it completely depends on the material and how well it lasts cut and in water. Um, but I've had um, arrangements last weeks, which is always fun, especially if you have it as a centerpiece. And another question is, what advice do you have for someone new to the art of a cabana? Um, it's always fun to watch YouTube videos or to go to classes, to join exhibitions. I mean, I find these kind of initial stages are really trying to absorb um, you know, some of the inspiration that's around you, see, you know, how other people are placing um, different plant material in the arrangement, because, I mean, you can always learn from, um, from different techniques and such. And ultimately, you know, it's, um, it feels like a very kind of personal experience. So although you're following these, you know, guidelines and rules of the construction of the particular style, again, there's always going to be some play. So if you like a particular flower or you're drawn towards a particular leaf, that's great and try and integrate it into that style. And so I think, I think that's all of the um, questions. Oh, wait, I have one more question. Um, any advice on how to help my child or family, friends, etc. feel the goodness of Ikebana? Um, I think it's always good to explore different mediums. So, um, you know, is it YouTube videos that would help? Is it, you know, eventually like an in-person workshop that would help? Is it Instagram videos or how-to videos that would help? Um, there are so many, you know, different elements or different, you know, spaces where the Ikebana community is excitingly active and um, working on their on their arrangements. And so it's looking at what works best for your friends or your family, or um, maybe there's some TikTok videos you can send them and, and that's how they're going to fall in love with it. Or um, again, there's lots of really great books, um, Ikebana books. Again, I'm just because I have it right here. The Ikebana Unbound, which is just, it's just beautiful. I mean, there's tons of beautiful pictures. And so if someone is really visit, like a visual learner, like that's, you can't really see it, but it's that, that's also a, a fun idea. So there's lots of different ways to, you know, slowly ease into, do I want to actually go to a workshop or do I just want to watch some videos about it for a while? And either way, yeah, that's completely fine. The community is there for all of that. Okay, but I think that's all the time we have for now. So I'll pass it off, um, Mr. Murata, for you to close.
<laughs> okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Brent, for uh, your virtual tour. You looked so relaxed compared with last year and uh, actually did a very great presentation. Uh, thank you. And so also thank you, viewers, all viewers, for your participation. Um, now I would like to close the floor. And uh, I also wrapping up my journey in Ottawa and Canada as well. So thank you very much for your uh, participation. And uh, do mo, uh, arigatou gozaimashita. Uh, have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Okay, bye.